What is it that constitutes fundamental basic natural principles? By Eric, who are you? We are all creatures of nature. Thomas Paine said it best in his book Age of Reason, where he taught that if you want to read the Word of God, then open your eyes, because it is written in everything you see before you, if you will just pay attention. Just exactly what is it that constitutes God is impossible to determine. There are as many different opinions as there are different human beings. It is impossible for humans to ever come to an agreement as to what God's rules of life are. Millions of individuals ascribe to the Bible, but there is a different church with a different man preaching from the pulpit of every one of those churches, all preaching a different understanding of the same Bible. If God considered that humans thousands of years ago needed such a handbook and provided it for them, written in their own language, whatever language that might have been, and if we need such an instruction book here in our time, then why does God not provide us such a book himself, written by him in our language so that we can understand what his message is, rather than have his message translated from several dead languages that no one out of time can claim a full understanding of, rather than have his message translated from long dead languages by members of the most deceitful species that he has ever created? It is not my intention here to present my spiritual orientation or to convince you that you should reconsider yours or to claim that I am being guided by God in writing this essay, because my point here is that there is no way I could prove <coughs> such a claim. My point here is that all we actually have to go on is what we can reasonably perceive from nature, which immediately calls into question the meaning of the word reasonable. What is it exactly that constitutes that which is reasonable? The meaning of reasonable and that which constitutes fundamental basic natural principles must be meanings that are as mathematically certain and irrefutable as is the undisputed mathematical fact that 2 plus 2 equals 4. The subject matter that I am addressing has nothing to do with what we consider to be spiritual or religions or biblical-based, as there is no possible way that such could ever be distilled down to a meaning or understanding that would be agreed upon and accepted by every single man and woman on the planet as it is, as is the mathematical fact that 2 plus 2 equals 4. The subject matter here has to and is limited to the interaction among and between two or more individuals, no matter the number, who all most likely have a different opinion or belief in regard to spiritual matters and that which they consider to be right or wrong. This reduces the issue to what we commonly call government. What is it that constitutes government? And more importantly, who gets to decide what constitutes government? Why do humans create government? I expect the reason is fairly universal. Humans living in a certain area, living peacefully among themselves, working to provide the necessities of life for themselves, cooperating between themselves, trading their excess for the excess of a neighbor, when they are invaded by a tyrant who threatens them with dire punishment if they do not provide him and his men with whatever they demand to which they have absolutely no legitimate claim. When the tyrant is absent, the good people decide they need to unite to create a physical force great enough to defeat the tyrant. They call this organization, quote-unquote, government, and they each contribute what they can to the cause, and the tyrant is defeated. However, the propensity of some humans to be tyrants seems to be a universal defect and all of them do not attempt to impose their will by brute force, but by subtle infiltration of the government, ultimately gaining control of the very force the good people had created to protect themselves from the tyrants. But the tyrants do still do not exercise excessive physical force over the good people because the tyrants realize the good people will only put up with so much pushing before the good people will revolt. So, 
How then are the good people to protect themselves from the insidious invasion of their government by tyrants? The good people must realize that there is no possible way to keep tyrants out of high positions in government because such tyrants do not advertise their secret private agendas. So the defense mechanism is to write a constitution for the purpose of limiting the authority of the government they are creating. The problem with this is that the tyrants are among those writing the Constitution. How could it be expected that the tyrants could be excluded? Who is it that always makes the argument that no matter how we limit the government, we do need some rules? Is there anyone who can object to the reasonableness of this claim? especially when the follow-up argument is that we must outlaw abortion, child molestation, and the use of unapproved drugs. Why is it that in these instances no one asks where the authority comes from to enable the outlawing of abortion, child molestation, or the use of unapproved drugs? How do we know if a woman is pregnant or whether or not she had an abortion? How do we determine what it is that constitutes child molestation? Oh, everybody knows what that is. Well, I don't, so would you please explain it to me? Drugs unapproved by who? By whom? Who is it that has any authority to determine what drugs may be used by another, or that certain drugs can only be used if prescribed by a doctor? Who gets to decide what it is that constitutes a doctor? The problem with these issues is that they are highly emotional. Why? Why are they highly emotional? Please understand something here. I consider abortion to be the most heinous crime that could ever be committed, far worse than child molestation or rape. At least in the case of child molestation and rape, the victim is alive and breathing and has at least some hope of escape or rescue. Where is there any scintilla of hope of escape or rescue of an unborn baby still in its mother's womb? I am not making these arguments because I am in favor of allowing these crimes. I am making these arguments because the creation of laws prohibiting abortion, child molestation, or the use of unapproved drugs directly impacts my freedom and liberty. Because when the government is allowed to enact and enforce such measures, it will not be all that long before we have the five million statutes we now suffer under in the most regulated and micromanaged society that humankind has ever suffered anywhere in the history of man. And most of you reading this have been indoctrinated in government schools. In government schools to believe that you are living in the freest country ever. So, when are we going to realize that bad people are always going to be in positions of influence and that there is no possible way that we can identify a bad politician from a good one except at their funerals? So, it becomes clear that in our Constitution, we must establish and set forth a strict limitation on the authority of government. But how do we determine how this should be worded? This is not an easy task to accomplish, but I contend that it has finally been accomplished. We must begin at the beginning, by examining our own individual selves, by examining the beginning of government. Where does government begin? Government begins with each of us individually. How much authority do I have imbued into me by nature? Is there any reasonable way that I can delegate authority to the government that I have not been imbued with by nature? What is it that constitutes reasonable? Reasonable, quote-unquote, is that which is logical, that which is held individually, equally by every individual, acquired at birth as an inherent aspect of our existence. Because I exist, I have a need for food and water. So does every other creature, not limited to we humans. Cut because I have cut because I have a natural need for food and water. Does that mean I have a right to take food and water from someone who is weaker than I? Enabling me to use my physical superiority to forcefully take the food and water from another who has used his or her energy to gather the food and water from nature? Reason, quote-unquote, will indicate that if I use force against others, 
that I must then expect others to use force against me, that in the long run I will be killed and so will others if we do not find a better way to procure our food and water. This is the way civilization developed, but we seem to have overlooked our need for freedom and liberty. We have become so wrapped up in social oversight and regulation of our lives that we have totally lost sight of, the, of that which constitutes freedom, and that it is now getting so bad that the powers that be are using their means to downsize the population because the planet is now overpopulated to the extent that if the population of the planet is not reduced considerably, that our worldwide consumption of energy will cause such a shortage thereof that it will be physically impossible for the majority of humans to survive because nature will see to it that the population is reduced to a naturally manageable number. It is clear that the government understands this, so the powers that be have been and are implementing a plan for the reduction of the population using the spraying in the skies of poisons and denying disease cures that actually work, replacing such cures with pain-killing symptoms covering medications instead of providing actual cures that are actually well-known to work, such as hemp oil, which has been proven to be an effective cure for every known disease of mankind. Instead of birth reduction, which would be the reasonable and compassionate way to affect a population reduction, the powers that be are using genocide and multiplied wars to kill off the existing population. So what is the bottom line answer? How can we common people regain control over the government we created? We must understand the individual natural limitations of each of us. We must understand and acknowledge that none of us have any individual ability to regulate the lives of any other individual, and most importantly, that two or more of us have no proper authority or ability to combine our non-existing authority over others in order to imbue the government we create with any more authority than the authority nature has imbued into any single one of us. That is, government cannot be properly imbued with any more authority than the authority naturally imbued into any one single man or woman. This is a mathematically certain formula for freedom and liberty and must be understood acknowledged and adhered to, if we are to ever establish freedom among mankind. Freedom cannot exist where voting is used to require the conformance of those who disagree. If the quote-unquote majority has a desire to institute certain regulations over others that the others reject, then the majority must stand down and acknowledge that it has no authority to command others simply because of the superior numbers of the majority. How many men would it properly and democratically take to vote the panties off of an unwilling woman? This example proves that voting, where the outcome is purported to have authority to command subservience of the minority, is a criminal act. And neither can freedom prevail where government is funded through taxation. Taxation? The word is nothing but a euphemism for armed robbery. The fundamental basic natural principle mandates that government cannot be properly imbued with any more authority than the authority naturally imbued into any one single individual man or woman. Kiss, kiss. The end.